Oh my. Hey guys, Jesse here. Today I'm gonna be building something a little bit different from my last two videos. I'm gonna be building a Viking sax with an experimental twist Damascus. The reason I call it experimental is because I'm gonna be putting a gradient into my starting billet. That's 18, that's 13. My drink keeps teleporting. Either it has magical powers or I have ADHD. Ignoring the fact that I might have ADHD, the first step that I take is the same as the last two times. I clean all the surfaces with a worn 80 grit belt, and then I start stacking my billet together. I decided to change the layout a little bit for my cardboard drawing. I changed that one layer in between each of the differing layers of 1084 into two layers. Hopefully that makes the pattern a little bit more bold. All right. I don't know if you could tell or not, but my voice is very different from my past two videos. And that's because I got a new microphone. Let me know in the comments if you think it's better and extra points if you can guess which mic it is. As for the billet that I just tacked together, I decided to do something a little bit different from the past two times. Usually I don't really care if the edges are overhanging, like if the 1084 is slightly wider than the 1520. So I took it over to the grinder and I ground it pretty much flat. I don't know if this is gonna make the final product any better. I, I like to think that it will because it did take a lot more time than just going straight to the forge. Once the billet is all welded together and the forge is on, I do my routine dip into some Parks 50. A lot of people mentioned in my past two videos comment sections that I could use kerosene or WD-40, but the reason I use Parks 50 is because it's more readily available and I think it does a better job. One of the things that I don't usually show is what I do when I'm waiting for the billet to heat up. Today it was BTD-6. Press one. The past few weeks, there's been a massive heat wave moving through Arizona. It's been over 110 degrees every single day for around the past two weeks. And I think the day that I was forge welding this, it was around 115 to 117. Combine that with the forge that's running at around 2400 degrees, it was essentially working in hell. One of the aspects about forge welding that isn't talked about too much, but is still super important, is just leaving the billet to sit in the forge at forge welding temperature. This promotes cross-boundary grain growth and makes sure the billet is actually glued together. It's actually possible to weld some materials without a press at all and just having them sit at forge welding temperature, but it requires a bunch of tools that I don't have. <laughs> oh, wow. The plan for this billet moving forward is to draw it out into a one inch by one inch bar, cut it into two pieces and twist them in opposing directions. I have to be super careful about my forge welds here because any inclusion or cold shut will amplify itself a thousand times when I go to twist it. Oh, of course. All right, this is gonna be long. One of the things that I really have to get to work on is building a jig to help transfer the heat from the forge away from the ceiling. As you can see here, it reached temperatures of around 180 to 190 degrees, and that can't be good for drywall. All right, I'm gonna let it cool real quick. Oh my God. If you're super perceptive or are just a human micrometer, you might realize that the billet right now isn't an inch by an inch, it's around one and a half inches by one and a half inches. I don't really know why I decided to cut in a half now, but I would have to cut off the garbage ends regardless, and I would have to have two pieces, so might as well kill two birds with one stone. As I was waiting for those two billets to heat up, I decided to test the rebound on my old anvil. As you can see, it's obviously pretty good. Those of you who have made Twist Damascus in the past or have seen people make Twist Damascus in the past are wondering why I'm leaving these bars so big. The reason I'm leaving them at an inch by an inch is because my plan after I twist them is to stack them up by only two. I'm not doing a really high layer Turkish twist, so I need to make sure these bars have enough girth beforehand.
Once I get both billets forged down to that inch by inch, I take them back to the press and I break the corners. This is super important because if I didn't, those sharp corners would end up becoming cold shuts. It's less of an octagon and a square with, it's more a square with broken corners because that's really what I need. It's probably apparent from all my grunts and groans, but twisting these bars was super, super difficult. I was sweating from head to toe, and I had to exert a bunch of core strength in an axis that I'm not used to exerting it in. You've definitely seen it in the past, but I wear a Garmin watch, and while I was twisting these billets, my heart rate went up to 140 beats per minute, and sometimes even 150. I'm a fairly young guy with actually pretty good cardio, so the fact that my heart rate went that high is kind of amazing. That was terrible. Need one more. For these two billets, I wanted a fairly high twist density. I didn't want to go too high though, because if I did, I would risk shearing the billets right off. And if that happened, I would have to forge another billet and retwist it. And if I did that, I might just die. Once I was satisfied with how much twist I put into both billets, I took them back to the press and I forged them back into squares. I was actually surprised at how much of the width I saved in the billets after twisting. Those two blocks that you see in the press are not an inch, they're 0.9, but I expected it to be around like 0.8. And the fact that I could keep them at 0.9 is really, really nice. I forgot who it was, but somebody commented on one of my videos that even though it's 120 degrees, I still don't sweat. But you can see here, I in fact do sweat. After both billets are cooled down, I take them both to the bandsaw and I cut off all of the parts that aren't twisted. Right, so we know which way is up, which which no, we know which way is left, we know which way is right. Once I somehow find out which orientation I'm going to weld them together, I take them to the round wheel and I grind off all of the oxides on one of the sides. The reason that I'm using the round contact wheel rather than the regular flat platen at the beginning is because the contact wheel focuses all of its abrasive power into a very small area of contact, thereby making the process a little bit faster. Once most of the oxides are removed, I take it over to the flat platen on my other grinder to grind away enough material just so that I see clean material across the entire face. I haven't made enough twist Damascus to standardize where I weld the billets together. So I decided to just do what I do on my usual billets and weld the sides and a little bit in the center. Alright. My plan to forge weld these two billets together is to actually do it by hand. And whenever I forge weld by hand, I like to use flux. I don't know if that air canister was close to exploding or not, but I didn't really want to find out. Here I am setting the forge welds with my hand hammer. As you can see, I'm not using a lot of force, but I am hitting very fast. After I get the original forge weld set, I let it sit in the forge for a little bit, and then I take it back to the press and I start drying it out. As I'm drying it out, I make sure to brush off the scale as often as I can and check those forge welds. I really, really want to catch any delamination early and fix it. The drawing out of this billet actually took a lot longer than you would think. I didn't want to put a lot of strain on the forge welds, so every single heat, I took it slow. I probably only took it down a sixteenth of an inch every single time. I didn't show it on camera here, but once I drew it out to around a foot and a half, 
I took it over to the bandsaw, cut off the new garbage end, and I put it back in the forge. As I was waiting for the bullet to heat up again, I kind of just let my brain run wild. The first thing that I did on the press was draw out my tang. The reason that I did this first was because I actually didn't have the correct size tongs to hold the bar. By forging out the tang, I can have them fit in my two inch wide blade tongs. That works well enough. We'll make it work. The thing about the Viking sax is that its blade shape is very, very similar to the modern Bowie. Keep in mind I said similar. The sax has a much lower blade and it has much less aggressive curves. When you see the finished knife, I want the first thought to come to your mind to be, oh wow, that's a sax. I don't want it to be like, oh, that's just a weirdly shaped Bowie. I love tongs. Forging the tip on this billet could actually be done a little bit later than I did here. I only did it early because it was less tall and I don't really like forging tips on wider stock. Twist Damascus is fairly unique in that the pattern changes the more you grind through the billet. Because of that, I wanted to leave the billet as thick as possible and actually not forge in too many of the bevels. I still forge them a little bit, but I did it much less so than if I was doing another pattern. That was loud. I can make this 16 inch blade with like 13 and a half inches of material. That breeze. Like I usually do, I cut off a little bit of material because my billet is too big. This blade was actually commissioned that I took last summer, and the commissioner requested a 15 to 20 inch blade. I decided to make the blade on the lower end of that spectrum because a 20 inch long sax is really hard to have aesthetic proportions with its handle. And the sax is definitely not a two-handed blade. I decided to forge the tang at a fairly high temperature. I think this was actually over forge welding temperature. I just wanted the least possibility of tearing that forge weld apart. My process for getting this blade forged out was a little bit scuffed. I usually bevel my blades a little bit as I try to get that final length, but the sax has such a flat blade that whenever I beveled it, it wanted to curve up. So I had to keep going back and forth between hammering the bevels, straightening it out, hammering the spine, etc. Honestly, that's getting pretty close. At least 15 inch blade, five inch tang. Uh, Let me, let me get this tang perfect, and then we move on to something else. That hammer that you've been seeing me use a lot is a four pound dog head from Ilya. I hear a lot of smiths say that they'd like to use the lighter hammers, like the two and a half pound dog heads. I've never been one to like using a light hammer. I feel like no matter how fast I swing it, it just won't do as much work as a heavier one. And over the years, I've built up muscular resilience so that I can keep swinging them for a very long period of time. Now that the blade's mostly forged to shape, it's time to get it ready for normalizing and heat treat. I'm doing what I usually do, and I give it a very light profiling pass on the grinder. I used to do all my normalizations with my propane forge because I only recently got this Paragon heat treating oven. I have to say, it is much easier pressing a few buttons than it is using a magnet and testing the entire blade for temperature. And even then it's just an eyeball. I only show one of the normalizing cycles here, but I did three of them and they were at 1650, oh, 1500, and 1350 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm actually brain dead. After the third and final normalizing cycle, I take the blade back to the grinder and I begin hogging off a lot of material. I hold back a little bit because I wanna quench this blade a little bit fatter than I do other blades. I really don't want that central forge weld line to blow apart in the quench. The temperature that I'm quenching this blade at is 1505 degrees. The data sheets for 1084 say around 1475, but it takes time for me to take the blade from the kiln and put it in the oil, and so I want that extra buffer of heat.
Ooh, yeah. After I take the blade out of the oil, I file test it and make sure that I get that nice high pitch sound. It probably helps that I left the blade fairly thick and I did some really accurate normalizing cycles, but at this point, the blade was very straight. After blowing off all the steam and getting those theatrical shots, I threw the blade right into another oven. The other oven isn't as accurate as the Paragon kiln, so I put it in there at 350 degrees, so even if it overshoots, it'll still be under my final tempering temperature. After two two-hour long cycles in the Paragon kiln at 425 degrees, it's time to waste a couple hours of my life and get this thing final ground. Before I started making this blade, I did some research on what the Viking Saxis geometry was supposed to be like. There's a lot of Saxes out there that are flat ground, there's a lot of Saxes that have that very apparent central bevel, and then they have like a gouge ground into the spine. I decided to just do a simple flat grind and do something special to the spine later, and this is because mine is made of Damascus, and a central bevel is going to make that Damascus look slightly weird. Here you see me straightening the blade with my three-prong jig and a torch. Apparently it wasn't straight coming out of the quench, and I just gaslit myself into thinking it was straight. Perfect. One of the things that stuck with me all these years is Alex Steele saying that time is money and you should know when to throw out your old abrasives. Now, if you know me personally, you'll know that I'm not too stingy of a person. I'm actually quite the opposite. But when it comes to grinding belts, I'm the stingiest person there is. I will keep belts for as long as I can. I actually have a shelf in the garage that has around 200 old belts that I just can't bring myself to throw away. I mentioned earlier that I was going to do something special to the spine. Here I'm giving it a very, very slight ridge, just like those that you see on katana and wakizakis. I have to be super careful about making the angles as obtuse as possible, because if I don't, it'll just start looking like another bowie knife. I was thinking about maybe setting my table at an angle, or making a jig to help me grind this, but I always freehand everything, and I feel like I'd be cheating on myself if I were to make a jig. Uh. All right. Rest assured, the running water that you hear is just me filling the bucket with more water. Now that the blade's mostly final ground, it's time to get that plunge line dialed in. Like I mentioned in my Kukri video, I don't have a waterfall platen, and I don't really like how flashy that round radius looks. So I put on a file guide, and I use an 80 rib belt, and I make my sharp 90 degree plunge line. The reason that I'm using an 80 grit belt and not a 36 grit belt is because the belts themselves have a radius. And the 80 grit belt is the lowest grit one that I have that has the least radius. It's only at a third arm. Actually, I don't need to file at all. I can just use the grinder very carefully. By very carefully, I mean very, very carefully. The belt can run off the side of the platen, and if it does run off, I will grind through the center of my blade. Now that the plunge line is as good as I can get it on the grinder, it's time to slap on some higher grip belts and bring the entire blade to a 400 grip machine finish. Two Tony grit belt that is dull has no purpose anymore. The belt I use to give the blade its final finish is an A45 Trizec belt. That is the equivalent of a 400 grit aluminum oxide belt. We're at 5726. 
that means uh, we're halfway to a million. Subscribe. One point seven five. If I want this to be an inch, I'll do three seven five on either side. Yes, this is material I have to grind off, and yes, I could have forged it thinner, but that requires foresight. Sometimes I wonder what machine in my shop can remove material the fastest. I have two grinders, I have an angle grinder with a bunch of different discs I can use, I have a hacksaw, I have my own fingers, I don't know which is the best. <sighs> okay. If any of my knife making tendencies are going to become my downfall, it's going to be the fact that I don't like sketching my pieces beforehand. Something like that. I could do something like this. The materials that I'm choosing for my handle are silk and bronze, African blackwood, and stainless steel. All right, we're done. According to my research, the sax has always been a one-handed weapon. And one of the tendencies for one-handed weapons is to have a handle that's too long. If the handle is too long, it can slip in and out of your hand and you can lose control of the weapon. So what I'm doing here is cutting the block down to an adequate length. At this point, the thickness of my tang is around 0.3 inches flat, and so I go to my drill press, I slap on a quarter inch drill bit, and I start drilling my holes. As I'm drilling these holes, all I can think of is all the filing that I have to do later to get this fit up to the tang. This is why I need a mill. Here I am using one of the tricks that I learned from Black Dragon Forge. Apparently, a file guide can be used for a lot of things, and this is one of them. Is there, a, is there like an auto file? Someone should make a like a massage gun with the file. Wait, I can actually do that. Okay. I have to have it on one power. Ow, 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 ow. Nah, that's not gonna work. <laughs> Even though all the stupid ideas that I come up with have a 95% chance of just not working at all, I still oh. like to keep doing them. Oh. They oh. make my work fun. Wait, that's really good. Honestly, this might work. There's a mini mark, but that can be ground off. So the handle block needs to go from 0 0.96, 0 0.625, all right. The only bad thing that's happened to me because of knife making is it's accentuated my nerd neck. Hopefully that'll improve. We can do these holes separated by approximately 0 0.3. One of the things that tends to happen when I'm drilling wood is that the drill bit gets clogged. So I always have a wire brush on standby to help me clean it up. Even though my handle block isn't too long, my drill bit is still too short to go all the way through. So I have to drill another hole from the other side and hope that they're aligned. Hi. When drilling these holes super close to each other, the drill bit has a tendency to try and wander into the already drilled hole. One of the things that I've realized that helps it not wander is to do tiny pecks. Once all the holes are drilled all the way through the handle block, I use some sideways pressure to connect all three of the holes. Drill bits weren't designed to be used this way, so if you do this, make sure to wear safety glasses because the drill bit can explode. Once the trench has been dug all the way through the block, it's time to do some final shaping with some files and some homemade handle brooches. 
With the power of editing, this doesn't look like it took that long, but trust me, it took me like six hours. Generally, when I go to burn in my tangs, the slot is already 99% carved. However, this time was a little bit different. Okay, I might need more carving. Home stretch of the handle block fit up. When carving the handle block, I also have to make sure the front and the back are perfectly square to the guard and the pommel. I think we're good. All right, let me get this guard on. Handle block. Oh yeah. So after doing some research, uh, it's not a good idea to weld stainless steel to carbon steel, which is what I was gonna do. So I'm gonna disregard that piece and use a chunk of mild steel. If it was hard for you to read my mind there, the plan for the pommel is that I'm gonna slip it on with a little bit of epoxy, and then after a day, I'm actually gonna weld the tang to the pommel. This will make it so that it will never come off, and I can get a flush finish on the pommel. Why is this easier to file than like, than bronze? Once I got the slot and the pommel all filed down, I decided to just round the end of the tang. This is sort of like the process in which you would make a threaded tang, but also yeah. slightly different. Guard fits perfectly. Handle block fits perfectly. And pommel fits perfectly. Once I have all three handle pieces all fitting perfectly and extremely blocky, I take them over to the grinder and I begin rough profiling the shapes. I'm going for a mostly ovular shape on all three pieces, but I'm going to do something a little bit special on the guard. This process right here brings me back to when I was making the Pugio daggers for Fortune Fire. That dagger had one of the requirements being I had to inset discs into the handle, and to make those discs, I cut myself a bunch of brass square pieces and I just ground off the corners. Once I had the guard and the pommel mostly profiled, I actually take the block to the grinder and I have to grind it straight again. Even though I tried super hard to get that tang slot to be exactly parallel to the sides of the block, I couldn't make that happen, so I used the sides of the pommel and the guard to make sure that block was square. As you can see here, and as you can hear here, my dust collection system isn't running. That's because uh, I accidentally used it for metal, and the sparks burned through the tube. And so now I have to find myself better pipes, or just revamp the entire system. Does not. That went entirely according to plan. Having that table with all those knobs is like having a Ferrari, but only using it to drive around your neighborhood. I never use that table for really complicated angles, and so I've only adjusted it the entire time I've had it, like twice. Anyways, here I am rounding the edges of the pommel. Contrary to popular belief, a pommel with sharp 90 degree edges is not that comfortable. All right, getting this started is gonna... Why are you moving? My plan for this guard is to do a little bit extra file work on it. I've actually never done file work like this on any piece I've ever done, but I've seen people like Will Stelter do it on their chef's knives. So I thought, why not try it on a guard for the first time? After I'm done filing that groove in the guard, I take everything inside and I begin hand sanding the blade. You're probably wondering, if you watched my first two videos, how come I'm hand sanding the blade so late this time? That's because this is another one of those times where I can do things out of order and it won't affect the final product. Now I love using files as my hand sanding sticks, and because a file is rectangular, I can use the big flat sides for hand sanding most of the blade, but if I want to clean up transition areas, I can use the sides and it's much faster that way. 
I figured it'd probably be fun to have a recurring thing whenever I hand sand to talk about what videos I watch when I hand sand. When I was hand sanding in the sacks, I was watching Dude Perfect and pretty much only Dude Perfect. I made sure to watch every single one of their bucket list videos and honestly, the cinematography in those is so awesome that I watched one of them twice. Oh, that hurt. My process for hand sanding the sacks was the same as the other two. 150 to 400 to 600 to 1500. And uh, here's 600. At a 600 grit finish when I'm hand sanding, I like to do these things where I kind of experiment with the fractals that the soapy water creates. As you can see, they can look super, super cool. And I'm wondering if I can get these patterns into a hamon somehow. Once the blade is fully hand sanded, it's time to etch my maker's mark. I actually thought that the blackened maker's mark that I did last time looked really cool. I don't know why I didn't do it earlier. Maybe it's because I didn't buy any of the perma blue, but this time I'm doing the same etching process and I'm also perma bluing it again. The etching machine that you just saw me use is called the Personalizer Plus. When I finally got my maker's mark sent to me by IMG, I wanted to get the best of the best in terms of the etching machine. And after a bunch of research, the Personalizer Plus was the best one that I found. The process by which I'm gonna etch this blade is gonna be two dips into ferric chloride that are one minute and 30 seconds each. And in between those two cycles, I'm gonna be using some 2500 grit sandpaper to sand off all the oxides. Sanding off the oxides is actually fairly important because it's the thing that helps drive up the contrast of the two differing metals. Oh my god. After I'm done sanding off the oxides with the 2500 grit sandpaper, it's time to get the blade ready for coffee etch. The coffee etch is much simpler than it sounds. I just mix up some instant coffee and I throw the blade in. And I basically can forget about it and nothing bad will happen. All right, two hours later. Yeah. Oh my god. <gasps> I'm not even gonna try to hide it. This thing looks insane. That coffee etch did wonders to this blade. But yeah, now that the blade is finished, it's time to finalize the handle pieces. And the first step that I'm doing for that is I'm hammering a little pattern into the top of the guard. I think it'll give the guard a little bit more of a rustic look. And seeing as the Viking sax is a really, really old weapon, I thought it would fit it quite well. And then after that, I darken the entire thing and then I sand the flats just to give it a little bit more contrast. Once the guard is finalized, it's time to give the pommel a really nice machine satin finish. Once the pommel's looking nice and after I totally didn't drop it in the bucket three or four times, I use some sandpaper and I get that wooden handle block entirely polished. If you polish African blackwood up really nicely, it'll start looking like black glass. It actually looks almost like obsidian. To give it that super dark glowy look, I hand polish it to 2500 grit and then I use two different polishing compounds. Now that everything is ready, it's time for that fateful moment, the glue up. I test fit the pieces just one last time to make sure that I didn't miss anything, maybe there's a gap I didn't see. And with that harsh lighting, it's really easy to identify. After I mix the epoxy with the popsicle stick for around five minutes, I make sure to clean everything and then I coat every surface that will be glued with epoxy. This will make it so there's not a chance of getting any air bubbles. If I were to make a blade similar to this in the future, I would probably do a takedown construction. One of the things that I always do, but don't necessarily show on camera, is me cleaning off the excess epoxy with acetone. On a handle like this, with such a high gloss polish handle block, if I didn't clean off all of the excess epoxy, it would be extremely apparent. After I give the epoxy 24 hours to cure, I flip it over and I weld on the pommel to the tank. 
it's extremely important that I cool it as fast as possible when I'm done welding because epoxy does get weaker when it's hot. This is the last step of the process and here is the finished blade. I love how much contrast I got between the 1084 and the 15N20. I also love how star-like that bottom bar looks. This looks like the kind of weapon that you'd see in a video game, like maybe Mario or something. Also, if you look closely, I got a little bit of auto home on, on this blade. It kind of looks like a trap sole and I'm all here for it. After all those B-roll shots are taken, I sharpen the blade with a 400 grit Trizac belt and then I take it inside to a buffalo hides drop loaded with green buffing compound. This sharpening process isn't as elaborate as some other people's, but the edge actually gets quite sharp. It's sharp enough to do any test that I throw at it. The only thing is it looks unprofessional, but looking unprofessional and being unprofessional are two very different things.